Okay. Show spirit. So let's pray. All right. Our wonderful God, we are so grateful. We're so grateful uh, for love you, for you loving us in spite of who we are on a daily basis. Yes. Uh, we have moments, Father, where we don't, we do not restrict our flesh. We do not restrain our flesh. We don't allow, we don't make our flesh be submissive. We just give in and you are consistently uh, yes. good to us. And for that, Father, all we can say is thank you in one in one breath and forgive us in the next breath. Please yes, forgive us of our wrongs, not shortcomings. Please forgive us. For, Please, forgive Lord. us for, for not taking you serious. Forgive us for not being obedient. Forgive, forgive us for, yeah, for yeah. just the lackluster lifestyle that we live. We just... We just oh, do yes. things and we just go places. We just we just, just do our own, we meander here and there with no oh, concern, yeah. no thoughts about you. And I just thank you for your patience uh, with you. all of us, dear God. We thank ask you, you Holy God. Spirit, thank you, Holy Spirit, for your consistency. You are consistently oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. speaking with us, speaking to us, guiding us, and forgive us for ignoring you. Forgive us for not... Uh, knowing who you are. It's, it's, it's oh, a yeah. lot of us. It's a whole bunch of us that wear the name of Jesus, but we don't know who you are. And because my of Lord, that, many Lord, of us Lord, are, Jesus. we are held captive and, and it's not a need. We shouldn't be captive being Christian, but we are because yeah, this yeah. pure lack of knowledge, just a hundred percent lack of yes, knowledge, Lord. lack of relationship. And, and we suffer, we suffer miserably. Oh, yeah. Yes, Lord. But we thank you for, being Thank there you, whenever Lord. we turn the corner. Thank you for being there. Thank Jesus, you, it goes without saying, your blood is monumental. Your blood mm. is, it is the key. It oh, is yes. The, yes. the propitiation. Yes. It is exactly what man needed. So thank you. Thank Sorry you, you had to go through all that you went through for, for us, for me. But thank you for oh, going Lord. through it. And thank you for thank being you, following thank through you, to the very, very, very end. You got to the thank end, Jesus, and then you said, then you said, oh, it is Lord. finished. It is finished. Thank you. We thank actually you. be with us this evening as we uh, begin this study this evening on the book of Ephesians. And we just pray, I pray, yes, Father, <clears throat> that you will allow me to speak um, yes, as Lord, the heavens have Father. prescribed, and that you will, yes, uh, that your word will just be, will Father. touch the different students, whether they hear um, on Zoom or they watch it later on um, on YouTube. Just pray that their lives are touched. Um, yes, Lord. It, it's one thing to get knowledge, but it's another thing to apply that knowledge to our spiritual walk. So I just pray oh, yes. that it's impactful, it's ch transformative, yes, um, and, and that it 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 puts us in a different headspace. Oh, we yes. thank you. We thank you for thank all and everything you, you bless thank us with. We say God. this in your name, Jesus. Oh, amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 All right, Miss Prosper, if you don't mind, we're going to have you to mute your camera and okay. uh, we're going to get it going. <clears throat> and so this evening, um, <laughs> I know I told you all that um, we're going to be dragging real slow and I, I pray that no one's getting upset with me. Um, I'm just trying to give you as much information as possible. It's, it's really hard for me. It's hard for me. <clears throat> Hold on one second. I got to clear my throat. Okay, there we go. Ah, now I'm going to get it. It's hard for me just to run through God's word, uh, for the sake of a timeline uh, for the sake of a deadline, I don't I don't do well with deadlines in God's word. I, I don't do well at all uh, because it, it's it's a lot of nuggets. I mean, really, it's to me, it's as if you go to your favorite restaurant and all your favorite meals are on display, all of them. That fish that you like, that cooked it just right, that steak is just perfect. Whether you might like to have a little pink or some pink or no pink. Um, they got the burgers. The burgers are nice and moist. They got the right brioche bread on the brioche bread on there with the with the uh, grilled onions, and you just and all of it's available to you, and you don't have to pay anything. Oh my God! <laughs> Places like that, you, you you just let your family know I'm gonna be here for a couple of days. Don't don't worry about me. I'm fine. I'm just gonna be right here. Um, all my food is on display and I got I, I to gotta eat it. I just have to. So that's the way I see God's word is it's, it's a lot of information. Um, so we are in verse seven, but I want to give you a couple of nuggets 
before we get into it. Uh, scholars have said, many scholars, they all uh, agree that Colossians and Ephesians are very, very closely related. There are a lot of similarities between the book of Colossians and Ephesians. And some scholars say that uh, Colossians was written first and then Paul deemed it um, uh, a, a good uh, a good idea a good idea for him to write he, write the letter to Ephesus. Some some scholars say it wasn't Paul because of the the writing style. Now I'm I'm not on that level yet where I can debate that thought. If it was Paul, if it wasn't Paul, um, that's that's another level of of knowledge of of information and preferably I can get there soon. But uh, right now I don't know. So I'm not going to even contribute to the argument, but that's what some scholars say. Um, the one thing I want to bring back to our memory, I know it was said at the very, very, very beginning, and I said it briefly. I remember saying it real quick. I said it and I moved on. But Paul is writing this from prison, folks. Um, I, when you are confined, when an individual is confined, whether it's prison, um, in a relationship, um, in, a, in a particular uh, career, you can find and you can't find your way out. You don't feel, um, oh, I didn't wave at, um, uh, at the gentleman that's supposed to hit record. I'm sorry. But anyway, um, you, you, know, you can find to a particular location and you can't get out. It, it's really hard for someone to come out of themselves and encourage others. That's not... Uh, a natural thing. Uh, it, it's when you have things taken from you, when you have luxuries taken from you, when you have your privileges taken from you, uh, when you have your freedom taken from you. And I'm not just talking about freedom of, as in prison, jail. I'm not just talking about that. But some of us might be or used to be or about to be in some form of confinement where you just like, oh, I just want to get out this job. I want to get out this position. I want to get out this relationship. But he or she is driving me nuts or, 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 or my body. My body has me confined. I got all these aches and pains. I can't wait to go to the doctor so they can give me the right medication or the shot or whatever so I can just get away from all of this. When you are confined, if an individual is confined, that word confined is so... Um, uh, Restricting. When you're confined to a wheelchair for X number of years, or X number of months, because you had major surgery, man, it just you 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 don't feel like yourself. Um, I had <clears throat> I had hip replacement last summer, and I was <laughs> I was confined to being the passenger in the vehicle with my wife, and boy, that was rough. That was rough. And uh, don't don't put no comments down there. Don't don't nobody make no comments. Yeah, y'all keep your comments to yourself. <laughs> but um, she drives perfectly. I mean, she perfect driver, speed limit, blinkers. I mean, she's perfect. She's the perfect driver. And I'm like, oh man, if I was driving, I'd have been I'd have been five cars ahead. Uh, and I, I didn't say anything. I was I was quiet, but I I, I was confused find because I had to wait till my hip got better and I just had to take it for a moment and 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 just deal with it. And when you're confined, there's a level of uh submissiveness, involuntary submissiveness that a person goes through. So now that I painted that picture, shift the camera around and point the camera at Paul. Okay? Paul saying all of these things from prison. Now, I know without a doubt that the prisons back in the Bible day versus the prisons we have today are completely different. I mean, I know what we have today is bad, and there's a lot of a lot of evil things, bad things that go on, and then some. There's some corrective things, some encouraging things that happen for reformation. I understand, but when you look at the the uh, uh, prison in the biblical times, the prison in these times, if you had to choose, not that you want to go, if you had to choose, I believe the majority of people will vote for uh, confinement in today's uh, judicial system versus being confined back in biblical days. It, it's it, There was no, a lot of the freedoms that our 
uh, uh, inmates have today are nowhere close to what they had uh, back in Bible day. And then there were some cases, there are some cases written in the Bible uh, that Paul was given certain freedoms for individuals to come visit him, bring him medication, bring him food, uh, bring him particular clothing so he can be warm, things of that nature. But even with that, <clears throat> prison is prison is prison. I, I don't care how you cut it up. Prison is prison. And if I don't, if I don't have the freedom, me, I'm talking about me. If I don't have the freedom to come and go like I want, yeah, there's an involuntary submissiveness that that takes place that you have to really adjust your thinking to. And for Paul to be in that position <clears throat> and write this letter to the people in Ephesus, whether he wrote it or not, maybe he had a, uh, he was sent his, sent his di dictation. It, it could have been, I don't know for sure. Uh, but nonetheless, um, for this letter to be written and then uh, with this, the level of, um, what's the word? The level of spiritual maturity that he uh, personified in his writing is, is unbelievable. It's unbelievable that he wrote so uh, spiritually high. He he spoke so he wrote so uh, so poignant about the Jesus and Christ and 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 God that you a, a person would forget that he was even in prison. So I, I think it's really something for you to keep in the back of your mind as you read uh, uh, Ephesians and Coloss uh, Colossians and all the, the Pauline, Pauline uh, letters. Just keep it in mind, most of his letters he wrote when he was, as the kids would say, on clank clank. <laughs> but but that's, um, I, I really believe that's, that's, that's a level of spirituality that we all aspire for, to be honest with you. No one... I don't think anyone wants to be, um, I need to pick the right words. There, there's, 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 no one just volunteer. There we go. Thank you, Holy Spirit. No one volunteers to be miserable. Situations, occurrences, tragedy happen, experiences take place where it leads you that way. But there's no, I don't think, I can say this generically. No one just raised their hand and say, oh, pick me, pick me. I just want to be miserable. And then when you are, when you are, Either uh, you are willed into that state or your situation directs you to that state. When you're in that state of misery, um, it's, it's, it's really difficult to shift your energy, your thoughts to others and say, what can I do for them? How can I encourage them? I need to write and, and give them some encouragement. I need to uh, uh, extol them. I need to lift them up. I need to catapult them higher to uh, to God. That's that's just not a regular thing. And, and for Paul to do this is truly, truly mind blowing. Now, I got that out of my system. Yay. Verse seven. Verse seven, we, we touched on it last week briefly, real, real brief. And I'm going to come back to that beginning. Um, let's just go ahead and read it. It said, verse seven, in him we have redemption through his blood uh, for the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. I'm going to come back to the in him. That redemption, um, I know you, you're doing your homework and it's coming from, um, where is it? Isaiah, Isaiah 63 7 through 14. I really hope that you're actually reading that and doing some real hard uh, research on it because um, it, it's it's really um, a different point of view from the prophet Isaiah about redemption. But this word of redemption in the Greek is uh, apolytrosis. Apolytrosis. And you know what? Let me just go and put it in. Uh oh. I need to get used to putting stuff in the chat so you guys will have that information. A P O L Y T R O S I S. There we go. Apolytrosis. So the prefix, the prefix apo, apo is a uh, means from. Um, and then luo is the root word, the Greek root word means to loosen or unbind or detach. And so when Paul says redemption, there's a a a withdrawing or a or bringing a person out of uh, their present situation. 
Um, in this case here, what Paul is pointing at, and again, I, I want you to keep in your back in mind, Paul's in prison, okay? Paul is writing and he's saying how God has purchased man back uh, from the debt of sin. Now, if, for those that might not know or just forgotten the debt of sin that he's talking about is over in uh, Genesis, over in Genesis, where um, the first man, the first woman sinned. And when they sinned, um, the sin was introduced to the world and it became a part of the world. It was something that we all um, have to contend with. And with, with sin being present, there had to be some level of, uh, there had to be a plan. There had to be a plan to bring man back. And I appreciate God for it says, the Bible says in him, we have, we have redemption. Uh, redemption is also a slave terminology. It is a, a phrase or a term that's used um, when an individual goes and buy a slave. I mean, just like what you know about slavery. Uh, back in the Roman day, I believe there was, I believe the uh, study says, I think it was 1.2. Hold on, let me find my notes. No, there was 6 million slaves in the Roman Empire. 6 million slaves. And think about that. There's a great possibility. There's a great possibility that the slaves in uh, in, that, in that six million, there's there's somewhere in there, someone in there that you know. Um, you had uh, an, you have an, an acquaintance of yours, or you had an engagement with, and it just could possibly be a distant relative. And so when the, when Paul uses the word redemption, and again, keep in mind, keep your mind, people, that Paul's in prison. Okay, you got to keep your mind right there. He's writing, he's saying that in him we have redemption. And so in Bible day, when an individual was buying a slave, um, if there was someone that they knew, someone they had an engagement with, had a relationship with, they would do the just cause and purchase that individual uh, from, from slavery and, and give them their freedom. Uh, this was what they call, they paid the ransom price. Um, this was done out of the goodwill of their heart. <clears throat> uh, it may, might have been done out of social status. It might have been done for particular accolades. It might have been done uh, just so uh, people can be, so that individual could be recognized. But nonetheless, it was a common practice. Uh, I can't tell you how often, but it was definitely a common practice before uh, those that will purchase slaves, if there was someone I, they knew, they will go and purchase that individuals and give them their freedom. They will pay their ransom. Now, <clears throat> just that little bit right there should bring, uh, should bring some level of excitement to your heart, uh, some level of uh, joy to your heart. Now, I'm gonna hit rewind. I'm gonna hit rewind a tad bit I'm going to go back to the very beginning of verse 7. The, the Bible says, in him. Now, this redemption, as you all know, you heard it before, um, you studied it before. The redemption is only in Christ Jesus. There is no redemption. There is no ransom to be paid outside of Christ when it comes to sin. Um, there's no substitutes, there's no turtle doves, there's no uh, ewe lambs, there, it's only Jesus Christ. And when Paul said in him, he is very, very specific uh, to the readers of this parchment that where they are in relationship with Christ. And keep in mind, keep in mind that there are other relationships that could be, um, be had with false gods, with idols. And but he's given them the edification as well as the uh, accommodation that they are in the best place that could ever be here on earth. Um, I have here that when Paul used the word here, I'm sorry, in, just like you heard last week, it means inside. He's talking about a position, location, realm, among, with, by, interior, space. And so however, wherever, uh, whatever you can do or they could do to get in Christ, 
that needs to be done with the greatest of urgency. Um, and I would I would echo the same thing sentiments for even us today. Um, many of us, and I briefly, briefly, Miss Prosper and I were just talking before class started about how there's a lot of wickedness going on in the world today. It, 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 it would be it would be in your best interest, well, as my drill sergeant would say, it behooves you, private. <laughs> it behooves you uh, to be in Christ, however you can get in there. Um, outside of Christ, back in uh, Paul's day and today, there is no true freedom. We they they can and we can can find freedom. Uh, it, with, with sexual nature, we can find freedom in uh in, in with in, um alcohol. We can find uh, freedom. We can re rephrase, rephrase, rephrase. We can find find temporary freedom. That's the word. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We can find temporary freedom with sexual nature. Temporary freedom with alcohol. Temporary freedom with uh, illicit drug use. Temporary freedom with uh, abuse of some form, some some way to whether it be another human or to an animal, whatever the case may be. Uh, but all those things are temporary. There's no true freedom. And Paul was very specific when he said, in him. He wanted them to know that you, you, you might be um, placating the thought of um, entertaining and being a part of those others that are uh, dabbling with idol worship, but please know and understand, but true freedom is only in Christ Jesus. And that good, that's the same for us. There's only there's only freedom in Christ Jesus. Um, let's go to Romans. <clears throat> let's go to Romans chapter three. Romans chapter three. Romans chapter three. Verse twenty four. Romans chapter three. Verse twenty four. And the Bible reads, being justified freely by grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 25, <clears throat> whom God sent forth as a propitiation uh, by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because of his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously uh, committed. One more time. Uh, you know what? I'm just going to back up to 21. <clears throat> Excuse me. 21. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. 22. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on, so on and on all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned. Get that, people. Get that piece right there. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That word redemption, that's that freedom. Um, it's only in Christ Jesus where we get true freedom. It's, it was only through the redemption of Christ Jesus that these individuals back in Ephesus and the surrounding cities was able to get freedom. <clears throat> Verse 25, who God set set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness uh, because in his forbearance God had had passed over the sins that were previously committed now you gotta you gotta recognize you need to recognize just just that little bit right there in 25 that passed over the sins Paul is making a uh, a foreshadowing of what took place uh, back in Genesis when God came and uh, Acts told the uh, Jews, the Israelites, to put get a young ewe lamb and get uh, put his blood, put the ewe lamb's blood on the doorpost. So when the angel of death comes, that he's going to pass over that home. Any home without the blood, that that family will suffer a loss of a loved one. Um, so when Paul is saying here in the latter part of twenty five, for the forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Now. These sins that Paul is talking about here in Romans are, it's not in totality, the same sin that he's talking about uh, here in, uh, uh, to the people in Ephesus. <clears throat> uh, and I will be, <clears throat> excuse me, 
what? We'll be there in just a moment. So now that we have some picture, now that we have uh, some understanding of redemption, how does how does John 3.16 sound to you now? How does that make you feel um, that because of the um, incomprehensible love that God had for man, there was a true separation between God and man. There was a true separation uh, when sin entered uh, the stage, when it came on the stage. When sin came on the stage, uh, there had to be, there had to be some uh, some plan, something in place to, to restore man back to God. And because of God's love that we that we all know uh, from John three sixteen, um, this love that uh, that's that G, that's mentioned in the book of John, this love is an aorist verb, meaning that it was a superlative act. Well, I like this. <laughs> it was a superlative act. This love that was demonstrated was superlative. It was first class. It was supreme. There, there's no act, there is no act that can duplicate that. There's less that matter of fact, as a matter of fact, there's not even an act that can come in second place. Let me just say it that way. There's not even a second place that comes uh, behind the love that God had for mankind. And because of that, the plan was uh, for, for to redeem man that was enslaved by sin was for Jesus to come and die for mankind. So now that you got that information, how does John 3.16 sound to you now? How does it make you feel? I can only imagine. I can only imagine. I don't know. But these, these folks in Ephesus that's, that received this information had to be truly encouraged. And again, Paul is in prison. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to make a left turn right here. I want to be on that level. I want to be on that level where my personal welfare is not a concern. I want to be on that level where my, my desires, my wants, my yearns um, take a back seat um, to someone else's desires. I want to be on that level where I voluntarily submit to God and do whatever I need to do in order to uh, encourage his children. I want to be on that level. And, and just for, uh, you know, encouragement's sake, I'm going to read John 3, 16, all the way through 18. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave. Well, that's a word right there. His only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him, excuse me, should, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but uh, that the world through him might be saved. That saved that Jesus is talking about here uh, in verse seven, the, the, in the end of verse 17 is the same word, it's parallel to the word redeemed that Paul is using in Ephesus. Um, he, in order for folks to be saved or redeemed, it had to go through the blood of Christ. Verse 18, it, the Bible says, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the one, uh, believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. Now, you and I both know <laughs> there are individuals um, then and now that are, um, that they're, they're suspicious about God. They don't trust God. They don't honor God. You and I both know that then and now there's there are individuals who uh, discount, discredit, disown, uh, belittle God. My my prayer, my prayer, <clears throat> excuse me, my prayer is for them. My prayer is is that God be patient with them. My prayer. Uh, a better perspective, John three sixteen for me is that I was and and truly loved by God. Yeah, I am making it personal. He loved me even before the foundation of the world. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, my prayer is that God blesses them, those individuals, with time. 
That's my prayer. But that's all I can do is pray. But at the same time, at the same time, you and I, we're gaining information. We're gaining knowledge that she equipped us to go out and bring a newfound excitement, a newfound understanding, a newfound energy to go out and tell somebody about Christ. I mean, come on, y'all. We we in verse seven. We went. We we are a, a snail. We on a snail's pace in the book of Ephesus. Uh, and we are only in verse seven, but in those first seven verses is a uh, a, a bucket load, a truck load of encouragement. So just the first seven verses is enough to give someone some some level of encouragement, some some fire in their spiritual bones for them to say, you know what, it's time for me. I I, I would imagine that's what took place here. I, I don't know, but I I can only imagine. Um. The word redemption, and uh, forgive me for being <laughs> tedious, but I just I just went all the way in with this word. <clears throat> the word redemption is an accusative noun, accusative noun. Now, meaning that we, huh, them, we are the direct focus. We're the direct subject of the action of the redemption. We were purposefully uh, chosen. Hmm. <laughs> How you living? How you living for Christ right now? How is your lifestyle? How 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 satisfying you think those folks were uh, back in Ephesus, Laodicea? How you think how how pleasing they were to God? There's there's some I mean you you man. There's some parts of God's word, well, not some. There are many parts of God's word that just make me close the Bible and shake my head like, man, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. And just to know, just to know this little bit right here, that this is an accusative noun, meaning that I, me, Ikina Lewis, I am the direct focus. I, God thought about me when he put redemption into place. Hmm. That should bring some level level of forgiveness, some level of uh, remorse. Or on the other hand, it should bring some, some joy, some satisfaction. Uh, meet me over in 1 Peter. Meet me over in 1 Peter. Yeah, here it is. 1 Peter 18. I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. 1 Peter 1, 18. This is for you. Ms. Prosper, this is for you. Here it is. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct or received by tradition from your fathers, verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world. There it is, folks. There's your amen. There's your amen, people. But was manifest in these last times for who? For you. <laughs> Can a church say amen? Amen. All right. Uh, I like that latter part of verse 18. It says, for your aimless conduct received my, uh, by tradition from your fathers, meaning that there was nothing, there was nothing to be gained uh, from your pedigree, nothing to be gained from your rank, nothing to be gained by your social status, nothing to be gained uh, by your associations. But everything, everything, he said, verse 20, was foreordained before the foundation of the world. So check this out, check this out. Hold on, hold on. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna see something real quick. Um, where is it? Verse four, I'm back in Ephesians. I'm Ephesians. Verse four, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blemish, holy and without blame before him in love. Peter says, Peter says, that he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, uh, but was manifest in these last times for you, for through him, um, for through him, believe in God who raised him from raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. So <clears throat> what an astounding thought. 
as beautiful and monumental as this world is, before there was ever a seed dropped, the conversation was had. The conversation was had with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit to redeem man. Hmm. You know what comes to mind, and this, this is just a student in me. Now, now I'm being a student. Now I want to go back and study where God said he, uh, he repented for creating man. I would like to go back and look at that. And, and that's that's the way I study. That it's just a certain thing. My mind just I, I go dig into certain parts, certain concepts, certain terminologies. But when God said that he repented for creating man, <coughs> excuse me. But we know that the plan was all always formulated for him to redeem man, and he did. And he the plan was always in play. Uh, for him to create man. Um, I don't know, just just a thought, just a thought. I don't have anything to give to you this evening, and I, I probably won't have nothing for the next coming Tuesday, but it, it's just a thought that just runs through my mind. Maybe one day I'll sit down when I get some free thinking time to actually go and dig into that a little bit more. But nonetheless, nonetheless, moving on from that, um, the, the, the glory is that that we were chosen and we were chosen. We were chosen even though God knew that we was going to be living in a sinful state. God knew uh, that we was going to be a rambunctious. We was going to be um, evil. Let's just call it what it is. We're going to be sinful creatures. But the a plan was for God always to redeem mankind. Going me to John chapter one. I'm still dealing with Ephesus. I'm still dealing with redemption. I haven't left redemption yet. John chapter one, John chapter one, John chapter one, verse 29. Um, the next day, John 1, 29, the Bible says, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him. He said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen and amen. Boy, I know that was an exciting moment. An exciting moment for uh, for John to know that Jesus was present and he's the one who's going to take away the sins of the world. Now, there's a little bit more I want to give you about redemption. Um, yeah. I'm not going to read a whole lot of it, but go with me. Let's go to Old Testament, y'all. Come on, let's go. I'm still dealing with redemption. And notice how, um, for those of us that are not really studious, notice how, uh, how, um, how broad I, I, I went to study for this particular terminology, okay? And I'm not saying that, no, don't no one take this as if I'm gassing myself up. This is just an example. That's all, that's all I'm doing. Uh, Deuteronomy 7, 8, Deuteronomy 7, 8, the, the Bible reads, uh, but because the Lord loves you, because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and what redeemed you from the house of bondage from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So remember we talked about, about uh, slavery. Um, there was no one capable of going to Egypt and freeing the, uh, the Israelites from Egyptian, Egyptian, Egyptian bondage. They were so uh, mistreated. E Israelites that is, they were so mistreated, uh, so beat up and, and uh, 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 ridiculed and belittled and uh, dehumanized. That's the word I want, dehumanized. There it is. They were so dehumanized that th there was no one um, mighty enough, strong enough with enough influence to go and free e the, uh, the Israelites. It had to be God. And so he freed them from Egyptian bondage and he paid their ransom. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter nine, chapter nine, chapter nine, verse 26, verse 26. Therefore, I pray to the Lord and said, O Lord God, do not destroy your people and uh, your people and you in, in, in your inheritance, whom you have redeemed through your greatness, whom you have brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And so this is Moses talking, uh, petitioning, interceding, making intercessory 
uh, to God for the children of Israel. Same book, chapter 13, 5. Same book, same book. I just want you to see how far back this redemption goes. Uh, 13, 5, it says, But the prophet or the dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord, the Lord your God, uh, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage to entice uh, from in, I'm sorry, to entice you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall put away the evil from your midst. And so this redemption that Paul is talking about, as mentioned, is a pulling away, a detaching, uh, a, a redemption being, not a redemption, a, um, uh, what's the word? I just lost my word. Uh, not redemption. It's a, um, mm, I can't get it. I can't get it. Anyway, there's a level of um, loyalty. There's a level of um, repayment. Yeah, repayment that is due to the one that paid the ransom. Thank you, Holy Spirit. That's the word I'm looking for. The ransom. When in him we have redemption. Since it's in him we have redemption, he paid the ransom. So we should reciprocate our loyalty to Christ because the ransom was paid. And that's what Moses is talking about here in Deuteronomy uh, 13.5. Two more, and we'll go back to Ephesus. Uh, Deuteronomy 15.15. 15. There we go. Thank you. 15, 15, 15, 15. Bible says, you shall remember that you were, here it is, here it is, people. There it is. You were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you, uh, I command you this, this thing today. Same book, chapter 24. Same book, same book, chapter 24. Verse uh, 18. He said, but you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt and that your Lord God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this thing. So go ahead, take in all of that, put all that, and it's so much more, put all that in a nice uh, little capsule. Verse 7 says, in him we have redemption. There's a, uh, an indebtedness. Oh, boy, the Holy Spirit working. Thank you. There's an indebted spirit we should have, they should have. There's a a mine that I owe. I mean, when somebody pays something for you, does something for you of great magnitude, I'm not just talking about buy your lunch. Now, I know when we go out and you say, hey, I got it today. I got it. And then you say, okay, well, I'll, I'll pay for it next time. That's not even close to what, 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 what's going on with Jesus right here. This is such a great uh, move. Again, the word redemption is an accusative now. They, us, and the future people that were going to be born to this world were, were the main focus, the spotlight. If they were on stage, there's one spotlight, spotlight and it's been sh shown, shine, shown on those individuals. We were the, the main actors, the main star. We are the star for this redemption. And because of that, there should be an indebted spirit in us to say, wow. It should be an indebted spirit even to the people in Ephesus that make them say, wow, he did that for me. And then watch how he did it. Watch how he did it. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to go ahead and confess to you right now. This blood that we that's mentioned in verse 7, I did not. I did not do it in any justice. I did not. I didn't. Um, I'm not going to make it your homework. But I'm going to tell you this, it would be in your best interest to go and study uh, blood, just the word blood. And then when you start off in Genesis with uh, Cain and Abel's blood and fast forward to uh, Leviticus and Deuteronomy about the blood of goats and calves and, uh, and, uh, and oxen, and then you fast forward to Jesus' blood, you're going to have, you're going, you're going to, you will create you will adopt, rather, better word, better word. You will adopt a true appreciation uh, for Jesus's blood 
you would take uh, you have a greater appreciation um for what all he went through and how his blood was splattered everywhere his blood was on the face of the uh the 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 gentleman whipping him his face his blood was on the face of the chief priests and all of the other uh Jews that was vehemently accusing falsely falsely accusing him you 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 have a greater 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 matter of fact as a matter of fact when next time you take the lord's supper next time you take the lord's supper if you haven't studied blood yet when you do when you do and those of you that have done it you know what i'm talking about but when you do you're going to have a great appreciation of that cup that small cup that's about <laughs> that's about the size of this cap and it has some juice in it some grape juice or maybe some uh some a uh, grape or uh, some wine in it it's going to take a completely different role. It's going to transform in your heart, in your spirit, because you recognize that had it not been for the blood of Christ, I wouldn't have this redemption. And, and, and you know, um, God himself could have, could have um, designed, formulated a plan that would have redeemed man Many different ways, many different ways. But what satisfied him had to come through Jesus. It had to be Jesus. Um, you don't need to turn there. I'm just, I'm gonna just go. You can write this down in your notes. Um, Leviticus chapter seven. Leviticus chapter seven, verse twenty-two. Is that what I want? Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's what I want. Leviticus chapter 7, verse 22 through 27. It says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, You shall not eat uh, any fat of, or of ox or sheep or goat, and the fat of an animal that dies naturally, and the fat of what is torn by wild beasts may be used in, other, in, in any other way, but you shall by no means eat it, verse 25. But whoever eats the fat of the animal of which men offer, here it is, listen, family, listen, 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 uh, offer an offering bag up. But whoever eats the fat of the animal of which men offer an offering made uh, by fire to the Lord, the person who eats it shall be cut off from the blood. Moreover, you shall not eat any blood in any of your dwellings, whether of bird or beast. Uh, whoever eats any blood, that person shall be cut off from his people. That's how uh, crucial and important blood is to God. If you recall, and we're not going to go there and read that tonight, but if you recall, uh, when Cain killed Abel, uh, Cain took his uh, brother out in the field and buried him. And he, um, he tried to uh, cover up his sin, his wrong, his his miss, his evil. His parents didn't know what was going on. They, the Bible doesn't give us any record of them asking question. Hey, where's your brother? But God did, and God said, God said, I love this. I love this man. We did a study like this at church uh, on blood. Um, and if you need some titles of books, uh, send me an email. I'm not going to type it in tonight. I have multiple titles. On books about the blood. Let me see. I have, uh, where are they? One, two, three. Oh, yeah, four, five. Yeah, so just shoot me an email. Say, hey, um, I need those, I need the title of those books that you that you have in your collection. I'll, and I'll gladly email them to you. But anyway, um, when 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 God confronted Cain. Uh, Cain, God said, God said, boy, I love this. He said, I can hear him. I can hear him through his blood. He's speaking to me. Oh my God. There's life, people. There's life in blood. And one of y'all, some of y'all are in the medical field. And y'all know 
uh, when an individual is in the hospital, they, the, the blood has got to keep going. We got to keep the blood circulating. We got to ele elevate your legs. You don't want to, don't want to have any blood clots or, or you need, we need to get some, so many milligrams, so many cc's of blood in them real quick. They type A, B, O positive, negative, this and that. Um, and then you have the blood drive, the blood drive, the blood bank have all this blood sitting up in a refrigerated area just in case there's a need for blood uh, of a specific kind. So there's life in blood. And after we did that study, I just made a left-hand turn. I apologize for that. But after, after we did that study about blood, I came to the conclusion that those individuals that were killed um, for senseless reasons and individuals hid the body, hid the wrong, and nobody can find where it's so-and-so. So they, they died, they were killed, they were murdered back in 1963, or this person was murdered in 1985, and this person was murdered in 2005, and there's no evidence, there's no, we can't find the murder, we, we don't, there's, there's no murder weapon, we don't have anything. I truly believe in my soul that the blood is speaking to God and God is going to reveal uh, who killed that person. And ever since we did that study, I've been paying attention to the news and, and it, it's been happening. Not that it just started happening, it just, it's, it's ha it's, I'm just paying attention to it. But the blood uh, of those individuals, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the bodies of the individuals, the remains of the individuals are being found, people are getting prosecuted, they go into prison, uh, so there's 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 life in the blood, and that's what Paul is saying. He says through his blood we have the forgiveness of sins. I'm going to read a couple more things, and we're going to bring this thing to a halt. Uh, that forgiveness. Go with me to the Ephesians. I'm, I'm sorry, Hebrews. <laughs> My energy is coming down. I'm winding down, folks. Hebrews, Hebrews chapter ten. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hebrews 10, 1 through 10. The Bible reads, For the law having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things can never can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year. Make those who approach perfect. Verse 2, For then would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshipers once purified uh, would have no more consciousness of sin. But, verse 3, in those sacrifices, there is a re reminder of sins every year. Um, they say, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls, uh, of goats, could take away sins. Verse 5, therefore, when he, Jesus, people, there it is, when he came into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you had, you have prepared, it you prepared for me. And burnt offering and sacrifices for sin, you have no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. Verse 8, previously saying, sacrifice and sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings of sin, you do not desire nor have pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to, you, to do your will, O, o God. He takes, he takes away the first that he may establish the second. Um, and here is my favorite verse, verse 10. By that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once for all. So, so what we have here, what we have here is that the blood of goats and bulls did not satisfy God. They could not satisfy God. It had to be the blood of Jesus Christ. That's where the, the redemption comes through. That's why the blood was spilled. That's why he was beaten. That's why all those things happened to him. And then when he said in the latter part of verse, well, not the latter part, in verse 7 of the forgiveness of sins, this was a total, total encompassing of all types of sin. We talk about trespasses, we talk about transgressions, and we talk about acts of disobedience. So when boy. Mm, hallelujah. Amen. 
when Jesus spilled his blood, when Jesus gave his blood for mankind, when Jesus offered himself as a living sacrifice for mankind, Jesus' blood was not only good for just trans uh, uh, trespasses, but it took care of trespasses, uh, transgressions, and all acts of disobedience. If that don't give you a hallelujah, I don't know what will. Mm. Woo! I think I'm going to stop right here. Yep, that's enough. That's enough. I'm tired. <laughs> I am tired. Um, no homework, because you already got some that's due this coming uh, Saturday, Lord's will. For those that are, you know what? Let me take a picture. Let me take a picture. I give you credit. Gotcha. Okay. Um, for those that are that wasn't on last week, the homework was to uh, talk about redemption from Isaiah 63. Let me, and I'll put this in here again, just in case uh, someone just forgot or whatever the case may be. Isaiah 63, uh, 7 through 14. There we go. So look up redemption from that perspective. Um, hopefully you've, excuse me, you've gotten started on it um, and you're just about done. And, 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 and if there's anyone, if there's anyone new, Please read the syllabus on what's required in the paper. Please, it's an easy four points to get. It it really is. I don't I don't want anybody to miss their point. So, um, I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. I'm done. Um, good night. I bid you farewell. God bless you, and um, stay in God's word. All right. Good night. Good night, folks. Night night. Good night. Night night. Good night. Good night. Y'all have a good evening.